Welcome to the presentation of our paper, Key Assignment Schemes with Authenticated Encryption Revisited. I am Jeroen Pijnenburg, and this is joint work with Bertram Puttering. So this paper is going to be about access control. And uh, if you're familiar with this area, you might intuitively think, uh, can we just combine a key assignment scheme with Authenticated Encryption? And indeed, it turns out we can. Um, in this paper, we um, formalized this. So we specified the security model and the requirements that the combined primitive has to satisfy for security. But we also identified the second use case where authenticated encryption will not satisfy the security requirement. But more on that later. So let's first talk about access control. Um, access control is about the protection of resources that we will also refer to as objects against unauthorized access uh, by specific users. Now, additionally, we would also like that authorized users can access our objects. Um, otherwise, we could just delete the data. And now this is specified by an information flow policy. So the information flow policy will exactly specify which user is allowed to access the object and which user is not allowed to access the object. And since this information flow policy um, can be represented by a hierarchy, this is also called hierarchical access control. Now, what exactly is this information flow policy? So an information flow policy, IFP for short, for a set of users U and a set of objects O is a tuple where we have a set L of security labels and a relation uh, less or equal than, which together forms a partially ordered set. And we have two security functions. We have new from the users to the security labels and omega from the objects to the security labels. And now we say that a user U is authorized to access an object O if the security label associated with that object is less or equal than the security label associated with the user. And in particular, we say that the user is unauthorized if this is not the case. And we need uh, to phrase it like this because it is not the same as saying that the object has a security label greater than the user. And that is because it is only a partially ordered set, so some labels may not be comparable. Now, an example of this uh, hierarchical access control. So in this diagram, an arrow represents uh, that the user is above uh, another user in the hierarchy. So for example, um, Brock has access to all the files that Dahlia can access but also Arya has access to all the files that Dahlia can access because Arya is above Brock, who is above Dahlia. And this relation in particular is transitive. Now note that Selene is not above Dahlia in the hierarchy because there is no path from Selene to Dahlia. So there may be uh, files that Dahlia can access, but that Selene is not able to access and also vice versa. So in particular, these two users are not comparable. And you can see the same also holds for Brock and Celine. So they have some users that are uh, below them in the hierarchy, uh, like Ethan. But as I said before, like there's users that Brock can access, uh, but Celine cannot, like Dahlia and vice versa. So also Brock and Celine um, are not comparable. And on the top, we have uh, Arya who is uh, above everyone in the hierarchy, because from Aya to everyone, there is a path. Now we have identified two use cases. The first one is uh, read-only enforcement. And in this scenario, um, you have all your files ready at, the, at setup. And what you want is that you want to specify which user can access which file, but you don't want the users to be able to make changes uh, to your files. So everything is defined at setup and it is set in stone from that moment. The other use case scenario is where you do want to allow users to make changes. So we call this the read write enforcement. 
And this is say uh, an employee is working on a file, say uh, Brock is working on a file and he makes some changes. He, he edits this file, he saves the new version and then he, he, he saves this file. So he, he basically writes to it. And then the next day, um, Dahlia, who also has access to the file, um, wants to uh, continue working on it, make some more changes, and again, save a new version of the file. So in that case, we would use the read-write enforcement. So here we have um, the diagram of the read-only, and just observe that no one is allowed to write to this file. So this file is specified at startup, and no one can make changes authorized users can view it and uh, if you're not authorized you should not be able to view the file. In the other case we have the read write and I think uh, the only thing to note here is that um, if a user has access to the file it can read and write to the file. So there's no sort of read only to this file. They can either access it when they can read and write or like Celine they cannot access it and then they can do neither. Now, I don't want to dive into the technical details of the model, but I think it's interesting to talk about some of the modeling assumptions that we have made. So in particular, we assume that any algorithm may fail or abort. And with that, we mean that it gives an output that was not specified in a syntax. And you can think of this as uh, authenticated encryption, say it gets a, a cipher text, but this cipher text is not authentic. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a forgery. So the algorithm would like to reject this. So instead of outputting a message, it will just um, output a, say, a rejection symbol or whatever error message it will output. Now we feel like if every algorithm uh, is allowed to do this, or it, it would just clutter the notation. So instead, what we have done is um, we assumed that any algorithm may fail and then it will just output an error message and left it undefined what that error message uh, could be. It could be anything that's up to the scheme. But um, the game Oracle would forward this error to the adversary. And the reason we do this, like if the adversary would actually run the scheme in the real world, it would also observe the error message. So if the, uh, um, adversary now queries say the decryption oracle and then the decryption oracle runs the decryption algorithm and this fails then it, the algorithm will output an error message then the oracle will forward this to the adversary. And note that in particular this implies that the algorithm should not leak any information because if say the algorithm says, oh, I failed because I was checking the tag and at bit number 20, uh, it didn't match. If this is the, the error message, then the game Oracle will forward this error message to the adversary. The adversary gains this information, could adapt its queries, learn from this and uh, win our security game. So indeed it is bad practice to lead information, leak information in the error messages, but now our model actually captures this as well. So this, such a scheme may be secure in other models, but in our model, um, this actually leakage of information is actually forwarded to the adversary and the adversary can use it to win the game. So in particular, any algorithm uh, that that does not leak any information with this error message will be fine. But if an algorithm actually leaks information, then the adversary should learn about this because the adversary should be allowed to use this information. And then if it wins the security game in our model, this algorithm uh, that leaks information will not be secure as one would intuitively expect. Now, how did our um, constructions end up? Um, as one would expect, we used a, a key assignment scheme. So a key assignment scheme um, has a setup algorithm that takes in the information flow policy. Remember the information flow policy um, has all the information about who is allowed to access what object. And the setup algorithm outputs um, a state of uh, sorry, a vector of states 
and public information. So sigma u here is the vector of states that holds um, a state for every single user and uh, pi would be the public information. Now, if a user wishes to derive a key for an object, it uses its user state sigma, it uses the public information pi, it specifies the object, and um, additionally, it could specify some associated data, and then this derive algorithm will output the key. And now for security, it is required that if the user was not authorized to access this object, then the key should just be indistinguishable from uniformly random. So this should just be a random key. And otherwise, if the user is um, authorized to access the object for correctness, we would like that this derive algorithm actually outputs the correct key. Now this public information uh, is a bit interesting in the literature because it's not always clear how the adversary is allowed to play with this public information. Because can it, is the public information just some constant value that everyone has, uh, that's always authentic and that everyone has access to? Or is the adversary allowed to alter it and provide it to a specific user? It's not always clear. Um, intuitively, you can easily fix the problem by always storing the public information in the user state. But for efficiency reasons, um, that's not what you want to do because then you have this public information and it needs to be, even though it's all the same, it needs to be stored by every single user. So in fact, what you'd rather do is maybe store it somewhere on a central server and then let users access it. But this is kind of a, a different problem. It's more of a, a storage problem. And we've also written a paper uh, on this called encrypt self securely outsourcing storage that solves exactly this problem. Um, this was presented at ASRX 2020. And if you're interested in this uh, storage problem, I'd like to refer you to that um, paper. But very briefly, what you could, uh, could think of here is say you, you basically, um, you store some sort of tag uh, in your user state and what you could do is you just hash the public information and you store the hash of that in your user state. Now when you want to derive a key you obtain the public information from the central server, you hash it, you compare it with your stored hash and um, if it matches you continue and otherwise you abort. Now this is uh, all formalized in the other paper, for, but for the purpose of this talk, we will just assume that the public information is authentic. So the other primitive we used is authenticated encryption with associated data. And I've again specified the syntax here. So it takes in a key and associated data and a message. And, uh, this uh, encryption algorithm uses this and outputs a ciphertext. And similarly, the decryption algorithm takes in the key and the associated data again, and then um, this time it takes in the ciphertext and it will output the message. So again, because we have assumed that algorithms are implicitly allowed to fail, we don't need to say like it either outputs a message or a rejection symbol or something. Oh, if, if the decryption algorithm wants to reject the ciphertext, then it can just abort and um, whatever error message the algorithm has will be forwarded to the adversary. And otherwise, if it's, if it's uh, an authentic ciphertext, then it will output the message. So this is um, what our read, read write uh, solution does. It basically uses the key assignment scheme to derive a key for each object and then it just use authenticated encryption to encrypt the object and decrypt the object as expected. Now the read-only primitive um, is slightly different because if we used authenticated encryption here it would not be secure and to see this you need to kind of think about it that we need to somehow protect against insider attacks because authorized users, they are going to receive the key 
to decrypt this object, but they should not be able to replace it. And if we use authenticated uh, encryption, then they have the key to decrypt the, the object, um, but they could just as easily use that key and the encryption algorithm to create, uh, encrypt a new object, replace it, and then the next user who uh, retrieves the encrypted object will just happily decrypt it since it was correctly encrypted with the with the correct key um, the decryption would just pass and the new user would not notice that the file has changed so what we did here is um, we're going to use something we've called binding tags so you see again the encryption algorithm takes in a key and a message and it outputs a ciphertext, but additionally outputs this binding tag. And the way you can think of this is um, just a regular encryption that outputs a ciphertext, but then additionally you hash the ciphertext and you store this hash value in your user state. And now decryption takes in the key and this binding tag and with the ciphertext, uh, the decryption algorithm will first hash the ciphertext and it will compare the hash value compared to the binding tag you have stored. And if it doesn't match, it will abort. And otherwise, if it matches, it knows the ciphertext was authentic and then it will just decrypt. Now note that even if a user has the key because they are allowed to, uh, to access the file, then if they compute a new encryption, um, for a different message, then the ciphertext would be different. So if the next user now tries to decrypt it, it will hash the ciphertext, it will realize it doesn't match the stored binding tag in its state, and it will just reject this. So in this scenario, um, users can only read, and they cannot uh, change the files because the next uh, user would immediately reject the file as unauthentic. Now, again, um, this uh, encryption and then hashing is uh, not as efficient because we'd have to go over the data twice. Um, but again, I'd like to refer you to our other paper, um, a Securely Outsourcing Storage at Azurx 2020, where we do solve this problem with one pass over the data. And if you're interested in that, you should um, read that paper. So what we've done here is um, we have two identified two separate use cases, the read only uh, and the read write. And we have carefully modeled these different use cases and uh, formally defined the security requirements. And I think the interesting part about the modeling um, is the algorithm failures. So again, the adversary in our model learns about the algorithm failures. While normally people People don't don't do this. So then, if an if an algorithm outputs um, and leaks information through its error messages, then the adversary would never learn about this, and in their model it would be secure. Um, while in our model, um, such schemes would be caught out because the adversary learns this information, can win the security game, and thus the scheme would be insecure. Um, so in particular, um, the algorithm should not leak any information because otherwise they would not be secure in our model. Thank you all for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the talk.